So thanks everybody. Um, Bernie, you're the guest of honor, so we wanted to make sure we we couldn't start without you. Bernie said to me, you, he said to me, Stuart, you SOB. Mandy Patinkin is a trained performer. He had all this script written for him. I had to rehearse everything to be ready for this. So we'll start with you, Bernie. Maybe we'll do some introductions. Um, Bernie, start with introducing yourself, and then we'll do Wendy, and then yeah. we'll start with the, with the podcast episode. Okay, ready. You can interrupt me at any time and get me straight, okay? Good. Okay. Um, good evening. Uh, I'm Bernie Blum. I'm a trustee of the LBI. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit of my story. I was born in 1933 in Germany, the year that Hitler came to power. In 1938, my father was picked up by the Gestapo and released the same day. Uh, to this day, I don't know whether he bribed or talked his way out. The next morning, we left by train for Rotterdam, where he had booked passage to the United States. Uh, in 1994, my mother passed, and um, we collected the family documents, and I had a chance to review them and learn for the first time about my uncle's career and his achievements in Siri. Probably the key document was a little booklet, which told us, which listed over 120 plays produced from 1938 to 1964, the year of his death. World premieres in German, of playwrights, not just from German speaking countries, but from around the world. Wendy, you can keep me straight on this, including in the US, Thornton Wilder, Tennessee Williams, in the UK, T.S. Eliot. And that gives you a feeling of the scope of his work. Uh, we collected the papers because the intention was to donate them to the LBI, which we did uh, for their archives. Uh, in about 15 years later, as president of the LBI, I was in London dealing with some problems that we encountered, not with them, but in work we were jointly doing. And I met Raphael Gross, who was a director, and Daniel Wildman, who was the assistant director. Both of them were natives of, of Zurich. And so I told them the story. Got it enthusiastic response from them. And after chatting for a while, we decided we needed to do a conference in Sui telling the story. It was 2015 before we, put, we created the conference. And the conference consisted of a performance at the Zurich Theater at the Schauspielhaus in Sui on Saturday with a packed house of actors reading for my uncle's correspondence. That was Saturday. On, on Monday, we sponsored an academic conference with people from uh, G German, primarily academic, ac <laughs> academics, and Miss Ahrens, who came over for this. Uh, I, 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 have to, I have to stop you there, Bernie, because there's, a, there's yeah. a part of the story that's missing out. So there, how did you get in touch with Wendy? And when, we should pause also. Wendy, could you introduce yourself to the room? Um, and then we'll get into the how you met Bernie. Sure. So hello, everybody. My name is Wendy Ahrens. I am Zooming to you from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And I'm a professor of dramatic literature and dramaturgy at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, I'll let Bernie tell the story of how he got in contact with me, because I've never heard this. <laughs> Okay, Stuart. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead, Bernie. Yes, jump in. Look, guys, this was, uh, oh, when was it? It was, it was many, many years ago. I don't remember. I think it, I was looking it was online. It was the fall of 2013. I remember. Okay. Yeah, I remember the date. Okay. Uh, anyway, I was, no, I find you online somehow. I, I don't know what I, what I Googled, but I said, hey, I, you know, I'd give this woman a call and see if she's interested. And that's begin. It was the beginning of a very fruitful relationship. Is that a good description, Wendy? Sure. Okay. Now, I'll tell the story from my end, Bernie. So me, I sure, got, please. 
I got an email from out of the blue from somebody from Bernie Bloom saying, I'm, I, I have a, a, a story, I have a, a project that you might be interested in, see the attached. Bernie likes to write very telegraphic emails. And what was attached was a list of plays that had been produced at the Schauspiel Haus in Zurich um, during and after World War II. And I immediately noticed the thing that I think he wanted me to notice, which is that there was, you know, the Glass Menagerie by Tennessee Williams that was produced in, I don't know, 1946, which was like a year after it closed on Broadway. And there was Streetcar Named Desire produced in Zurich in 1949, also like months after it closed on Broadway. And all of these, you know, kind of recognizable names, Arthur Miller, Eugene O'Neill, uh, uh, Thornton Wilder, you know, American names, and then T.S. Eliot, and then a bunch of other, you know, kind of foreign, you know, international playwrights. And I said to Bernie, Bernie, I said, sure, I'm interested. And we talked the next day and I said to him, this is really interesting. There's a story here. You know, how did how did these plays end up on the Zurich stage during the war and right after the war when they had like literally just closed on Broadway? Like, what's the story behind that? And Bernie said, yeah, that's what I want you to find out. So that was the kind of beginning of that relationship. And it's it was a it was a journey. Great. Good and, note. Yeah. Wendy's the brains of this operation. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I, I cut you off because you were describing the conference that Wendy, I guess, presented her paper at. Yep. I guess, and I'm going to guess it was 2018, I think, 2017, but uh, 2015. Not okay, not to get too hung up on dates because I got them wrong. But anyway, um, the conference, describe the conference. So what happened then? Well, it was, you know, as I said, it was a series of events, uh, theater. We were put together, we got great PR through the city, it was covered by the radio and media, and it got everybody's attention. Uh, this is not part of my plan story, but uh, about three years ago, Swiss, uh, the Swiss equivalent of Voice of America took the whole story and produced a bunch of PDFs about it with photographs and, and, and pictures and quotes. So, I mean, it, looked, it really left an impression. In, in Sicily. And then we had the academic conference. It was all pretty straightforward. So I guess what happened next would be of interest to some people here on the call because you decided yeah, well, that I, you wanted it to get, you wanted that story to go beyond the world of academics. And yeah, maybe, that's, you know, and that's for, those of, for those of you who don't know about Bernie, Bernie has been, uh, I've I've known Bernie through his daughter for about 40 years and his uh, his daughter was joking, Amy, who some of you probably know, that at the last board meeting, they were saying, Bernie is dragging us into the 21st century uh, <laughs> at the LBI. And one of the things you had done prior to this was the digitization of the archives. Yeah. Maybe you want to describe a little bit of that process. Okay. Um, I joined, well, after donating the paper, I, I got a lot of time. <laughs> We got time. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Long story short, um, I went to the LBI, met the executive director, and found that her brother was married to a friend of the family's in Buffalo and was a friend of ours. So that began my involvement with the LBI. And I became a trustee. Uh, I became president. Uh, and after doing those things, I met with uh, Frank Mecklenburg, who's still involved with the LBI, and, and Carol Strauss, who at the time was executive director. And I said, have you guys ever thought about doing an archives? And they said, yeah. I said, well, what have you got? And they gave me this piece of paper and they looked for some kind of a grant. I said, no, no, this is not the way to, this is not the way to do it. Uh, so let me, let me make a long story fairly short. What happened was I said, I will finance and I will manage this and we're going to digitize the entire archives. We got very lucky. An internet archive in the Presidio in San Francisco, uh, who are the, well, the home of really, they, they are the key people. They said, oh, people have done card catalog. Nobody's ever done an archive. We want to work with you. I said, okay. <laughs> and. Um, so we spent two and a half years. We brought in a very bright woman who was actually doing the day-to-day -day management of it. And it cost, well, two and a half million bucks. But at the end, 
the LBI had now has and had since that time digitized archives. And, and uh, you know, beyond you know the impetus for that. Obviously, there's a lot of technology involved, but what was the why? Why was it important? You thought for the LBI to be online? Well, prior to that time, if somebody wanted to ac access the archives, they had to come to New York and look at microfilms. Now, having the microfilms really aided the digitization process. Now, anybody in the world, anywhere who has interest can access them, which has given the LBI worldwide expo ex exposure uh, to their archives. And it was an enormous, I mean, there's a lot of archives. I, I mean, David or Frank could probably give you the number of feet of material, mm -hmm. but it, the only way to reach it was to go to New York or to con contact New York have somebody search and send information to them on a limited basis. It really hampers academic research. Wendy, yeah, you were so I, yeah, well, I was gonna add on to that because I think that was part of the appeal, a uh, part of Bernie's appeal to me was originally was this is all online, this is all digitized. And he sent me to the, you know, kind of finding aids for the archive, which are really beautifully organized. So whoever did that, it sounds like she was quite brilliant. Um, so, you know, as a as a researcher, this was something that I could be doing in Pittsburgh, you know, kind of really digging into all of this rich trove of materials that includes visual materials, includes, uh, you know, a, a zero, you know, photocopies of programs, of playbills, of, uh, you know, in Kurt Hirschfeld's uh, situation of all of his letters, all of his correspondence, but also all of the speeches that he wrote. And you can see various versions of the speech. So he's got, you know, they're typed out and then you, you see his, you know, handwritten cross outs and, and, you know, corrections. And then you see the next version of the speech that you, either he or his secretary typed. So you can see the evolution of his thinking. Um, you can see, you know, sort of where he, you know, kind of sort of tore things out of newspapers, his clippings. I mean, he had this, you know, it's all there. And digging into that allows you to really paint a, you know, very full picture of who he was as a thinker um, and as an artist and as a public figure. Um, so, I mean, it's just like it's I, I, it can't be overstated how valuable it is to have these things digitized. And I want to get back to the Kurt Hirschfeld story for it, obviously in a second, but I just want to also point out that this this project of public history, which is really what the podcast grows out of, you know, really is there's a there's a process i mean it really and i i, I just wanted to, i thought it was important for people to understand that um can i, can so, I add something to that story yeah, yeah because please. you're part of that and you may also undersell your uh role in this because you know bernie uh, called my attention to the history i wrote an academic paper you popularized it right you you wrote the narrative that allows people to kind of really imagine the story in a way that is narrativized and that's exciting and that when mm. mandy I think and re reads that script, it just has this kind of beautiful suspense to it and really kind of, you know, kind of reels you into the world of Kurt Hirschfeld. So I think that the process, I don't know if it ends with you, but it's certainly like it kind of comes to its fruition with this podcast that kind of really is public history in a way that's very accessible, but also really intriguing. Yeah, and, and based on original research that was made partially, you know, in this case, because of you were able to access it um, online and I maybe for those who aren't familiar with Kurt's story and significance maybe Wendy you could talk a little bit about that um, sort of both in terms of the excite the like exciting I mean exciting is maybe that's a, maybe the wrong word to use but the dramatic life he led to get him to the Schauspiel House and then his impact on European theater um, both during and after the war Sure. So first of all, just in case it hasn't become clear now, Kurt Hirschfeld is Bernie Blum's uncle. It's his mother's brother, right, Bernie? Correct. Yeah. So, um, so one reason why this is of you know of clear interest to Bernie is that he's also excavating family history. So Hirschfeld was a a a, a, a man of the theater who, in 1933, when the Nazis came to power, he was. Uh, working and living in Darmstadt, um, and he was working with the director Gustav Hartung, um, who was a you know a known sort of communist. Hirschfeld was also a left-wing thinker, Marxist, and also a Jew. 
um, obviously in Germany. And when the Nazis came to power, um, both Hartung and uh, Hirschfeld were like clearly on, you know, the sort of the blacklist um, and knew that their lives were in danger because the Nazis, you know, immediately went for cultural makers, theater makers, writers, um, and also, you know, leftist political people. So Hartung sort of took off for Switzerland almost immediately. Hirschfeld went to Berlin secretly, got sort of spirited there by friends. And when Hartung got to Switzerland, he convinced um, Ferdinand Rieser to hire uh, Hirschfeld as his, as the dramaturg for the um, Schauspiel House. And uh, Ferdinand yeah, and, and sorry, can I just, just pause you? Because um, dramaturg is a, is a it, it's a, it, it was who he is, but not yeah. everyone knows what that is. Could you explain what, what, what that, Sure. I'm going to explain what it was in, in, in Germany and Switzerland at the time. So yes. because it's a little bit different here in the United States. But basically, yes. it's somebody who is a kind of literary advisor to the artistic director, someone who helps to program the season, who works with directors to kind of realize what they're doing on stage, works with playwrights to help, you know, kind of uh, create and, you know, sort of um, uh, you know, workshop their plays. Um, so, you know, and in Hirschfeld's case, really dramaturg was like somebody who identified plays to put into the season. He really was very much a season planner and season builder. And, and the question is a good one because I think uh, Rieser, who was the uh, sort of businessman who owned what was then the Schauspiel House in, in Zurich, had no idea what a dramaturg was either and also had no interest in working with one like Hartung sort of made it a sort of like a condition of employing him to bring on um, Hirschfeld as his dramaturg. So Rieser was kind of like what you know he Rieser was he he had a commercial house he wanted to make money he did not he had no interest in making like art. Um, and uh, Hirschfeld very quickly changed his mind um, and started to kind of you know lean on him to start to put on stage work that was more, you know, relevant, meaningful, that was anti-fascist. He also uh, leaned on Reeser and kind of worked with Reeser to start hiring actors and designers um, and writers who were under threat in Nazi Germany and bring them to Switzerland to safety and also so that they could work. And in just in the like first year and a half that he was there, he managed to rescue all sorts of, um, you know, uh, leading uh, German actors and theater artists and kind of get them out of Germany and into Switzerland. Um, he then like, Rieser then fired him and he had to leave Switzerland for about three, four years. And he ended up in Russia working for a, as a journalist there and then managed to make his way back to Switzerland. And at that point, uh, Rieser had discovered that he was then like in danger. He took off, I think for the United States um, mm -hmm. and the, and, and Hirschfeld worked with um, uh, some leading citizens of Switzerland to form the non, the kind of public private enterprise that is the Schauspielhaus Zurich. And at that point, some of them wanted to put Hirschfeld in charge of the theater, but because he was Jewish and because he was not Swiss, the local Swiss were very against that plan. And so they found a Swiss, uh, uh, sort of artistic director. His name was, um, uh, Walter, what was it? Uh, uh, Oh, I'm Velterlin. I'm forgetting his name. Anyway, um, and and uh, uh, Hirschfeld became the dramaturg of that. Uh, so he became sort of the second hand, the second in command of the theater. And from 19 like 38 until 1964, um, Hirschfeld was the uh, dramaturg. And then for the last, I think, four or five years of his life, he was the artistic director of the Jeff House. And as the dramaturg, he was responsible for programming most of the plays, and he set about sort of using the Schauspiel House as a kind of, you know, beacon of, uh, you know, sort of free theater in what was otherwise like fully occupied Europe. Um, it was one of the only free theaters in, you know, on the continent during the um, Nazi period. And uh, he programmed all sorts of international plays. He programmed all sorts of um, classical plays and then in very deliberate ways sort of, you know, used them to kind of send an anti-fascist message. And after the war, um, you know, when, they started to reopen the German theaters. Hirschfeld's, all of the plays that he had had translated during the war became the repertoire for Western Germany and Austria after the war. So the, the, the theatrical scene in Germany in, um, was rebuilt on the basis of what the Schauspiel House had managed to produce during the war. So he had an enormous influence on the German theater in the post-war period because the jump starting of theater, um, you know, kind of was, fully due to sort of the readiness of the Swiss artists to send, you know, plays and props and actors back into Germany. That's the and, short version of the story. 
amazing. Thank you. And I, I wonder if you could just for us, because theater had a different meaning in the 30s and 40s in the German speaking world and sort of how did it fit into intellectual culture, popular culture, day to day life? Yeah, so I mean, it was, you know, theater, especially, I mean, it's, it's still the case in Europe that, you know, most theater is repertory, so you could kind of go every night of the week and see a different show, which is different than we have, you know, at the same theater. Um, but it was it was kind of the, you know, this, this kind of the, the central democratic, you know, place where people came to see things and talk about them. It had a it had a very important role culturally that, you know, became later in the 20th century superseded by television and I guess film. Um, so, you know, in Zurich, the theater was really, you know, a kind of a site of community gathering and you know, for Hirschfeld, and certainly from his point of view, the theater, what he called it a forum, right? This is the forum where we come together to talk about, you know, difficult, um, you know, questions and to really, you know, sort of present differing points of view. So for Hirschfeld, the theater was not just a place where you would sort of only put on anti-fascist work, but rather um, what was anti-fascist about it is that there was a multiplicity of viewpoints. Um, at the same time, during the same time period, the Nazis were, you know, sort of uh, uh, forwarding a program of cultural conformity everywhere where they had managed to kind of, you know, uh, 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 occupy. So that they were bringing the same plays and the same kinds of entertainment. And usually it was very, you know, light entertainment, what Hannah Arendt later called, you know, the banality of fascism or the banality mm -hmm. of evil. Um, you, know, you know, stuff that would just kind of, you know, made people sort of stop thinking. Um, and it all had just kind of one message of, you know, sort of everything's okay here. Um, and, you know, in Zurich, you know, Hirschfeld programmed against that by saying, I'm going to have a multiplicity of voices. I'm going to have a Catholic play one night and a play by a you know, Jewish writer another night. And then this one's going to be left wing and this one's going to be more conservative. And through that kind of, you know, seeing that multiplicity of voices, you are actually, you know, kind of uh, supporting a democratic way of thinking, right? And, a, and it, that's, a, that's a liberal mode of thinking. It's not just one thing. So he has a very famous, or I don't know, for me, it's a famous quote of, you know, theater is not a forum. I mean, it's not a pulpit, it's a forum. Right. It's, you know, that, that, that it's a place where people come together to talk about things. And so he saw that as, you know, this kind of very important role that the Shakespeare House could play for his community. And now there's another expression that he had for theater, which I think Bernie was one of the things that you really keyed on to in your initial research, the idea of theater as a weapon. And I wondered, Bernie, if you could talk a little bit about that, because that really spoke to you. Yeah, no, with all due respect, that was my that was my phrase. Oh, okay. we, we actually went through a stage. We had the conference in Zurich. The theme yeah. was Schauspiel Haus Weltbühne, which is the Schauspiel Haus World Theater. And that mm -hmm. was the kind of the message. But in contemporary times, uh, it's a liberal versus right wing continuing war. And in this case, uh, I thought theater as a weapon was an appropriate phrase to use to uh, to title this work, to define this work. And, you know, Bernie, you, um, so for those people who don't know your own personal history, um, you returned to Germany after the war in the American army, in the cavalry, I believe, I got that right. Uh, armored cavalry, right? Yeah, armored cavalry. Yes, no, not on a horse. <laughs> well, there are a bunch of Texans who still talk about horses, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but you um, were able to spend some time on weekends with your uncle. Yeah, no, I would I would drive, well, actually, the story, the, going way back, uh, the U.S. Army, I mean, my, my tour of duty in, in Germany as a lieutenant was, was a vacation. They shipped over my Ford V8 car. I had to go up to Northern Germany to uh, pick it up. And my aunt, Kurt's wife, Teta, uh, the family had a place, an island in, or at a, yeah, an island in the, uh, in the North Sea called Zut. And it is a uh, very high, it's, it's, if you will, it was the Nantucket of Germany at that time. It still is, except it's now gotten very fancy. Anyway, um, and the story from there is, if I can remember the guy's name, uh, they had a nude beach and I was there with my uncle and my cousin and the nanny uh, and I can't remember, my aunt must have been there. 
But here comes a guy marching down the beach, full fig, suit, vest, woman on his arm. And right now I blank on the name, but it was an eminent. An he was a Tillich. It was Tillich, the um, yeah, Boston theologian. Tillich. Sorry, and I wasn't actually prompting the nude beach story. I was actually looking for something else, but I've heard this. So go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. And he just came walking down the beach and he saw my uncle. So we all went and chatted. I mean, he, my uncle chatted with him. They knew each other. And then my uncle came back and sat down with us again. He said, that was not his wife. <laughs> And I've done some a little bit of research, and apparently he was a womanizer. Okay, I think he's dead by now. So this was apart this from was that, nine, rather, this was 1957. All yeah. right. What was your impression of your uncle at the time, and of the theater scene in Zurich, as much as best as you could make out? Yeah. Well, we also did a roots tour through Germany. We mm -hmm. stopped at the house that I grew up in in Hanover. We went to a small town in the mountains near Hanover where the family had roots. And then, no, he was, um, uh, first of all, just uh, to fill out the picture, his wife, Teta, was an actress and he was in his 50s at that point. She was in her 20s. And her father, uh, I can't remember his first name, Scharf, was a leading German expressionist, artist. In fact, he was one of the artists exhibited at the Haus der Kunst in Munich. In München, uh, as one of the degenerate artists. So, and their daughter, Ruth, uh, is the is still. I would visit with them. I went to the theater one night. I did see the women of Szechuan, and uh, and just you know had some exposure to all of this. And um, you were also over just to go a little bit forward in the '60s when your uncle passed away. You went for the funeral. Yeah. And to talk about a little bit about the impact that he had culturally in the German speaking world. I mean, can you describe a little bit about what that was like. Yeah. Uh, Wendy knows more about the details than I do. I, I only have my, you know, limited personal experience. Mm -hmm. uh, my uncle died. I immediately got on a plane, didn't even have a, my passport already expired and went to Zurich. And, uh, trying to pick out the right pieces of the story well and wendy you could maybe you can help me at the breakfast table in the cramped little kitchen of my uncle's apartment i was at breakfast with friedrich Dorn, and i think max frisch and this one other guy again a german author and i can't i tried to look him up the other day couldn't find him but the three of us sat there and ch chatted and during my at the time for the benefit of my this is a he was the original German, his original German story became The Visit, which was star, which was a movie at that time starring Ingrid Bergman about a, a woman who came back to the city where she uh, had worked, and, you know, a rich widow came back or something like that. Mm. So it was, to me, it was just, I mean, I knew the story. I was, and uh, during my, you know, he was a pastor's son and just sold the earth and the three of us just sat around and chatted. So that was, you know, a significant experience in my life. Maybe, Wendy, to talk a little bit about that longer, the, the bigger impact, because I think, you know, in the podcast, for those of you who get a chance to listen to it, I mean, it really is an extraordinary story from, you know, Berlin and Brecht and sort of that world of uh, German theater survival, thumbing the nose quite actively at great risk to themselves. Uh, you know, to the totalitarian regime in Germany. And then, um, but then this survival of a, of a liberal consciousness in German theater and sort of what that meant. And that sort of, that great flowering was kind of the, the gift of this small arc in a way of uh, creators. Maybe you talk a bit about that, Wendy. Sure, yeah. I mean, you know, if, if for anybody who doesn't know, like, you know, Frisch and Durenmatt are the two great Swiss playwrights of the 20th century. And, you know, Hirschfeld discovered both of them. You know, he, he mentored Frisch, he mentored Durenmatt, he, you know, supported their careers. I think they both had a home at the Zurich Playhouse. And both of them, you know, build their, you know, entire sort of style and their aesthetic on the kind of work that they were seeing in the, in the Zurich Schauspielhaus. So, you know, you can trace like a line from, uh, you know, Frisch and Durnmott back to Thornton Wilder and, you know, Luigi Pirandello in terms of like influence 
or, you know, so, and those are, the, you know, the fact that uh, uh, Hirschfeld was programming Pirandello and Thornton Wilder and Brecht um, means that we then have Frisch and Dornmott as sort of, you know, the kind of the next generation of writers who are, you know, working experimentally in terms of form and in terms of um, content. Yeah. Uh, uh, what, yeah, I wanted, what we're missing now is the, the Brecht story, although they weren't great friends, but certainly a strong relationship. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I mean, Brecht, Brecht's, you know, sort of artistic home during the war and right afterwards, the first place he landed when he came, you know, he was in the United States during the war uh, in exile. And, you know, after he had his, you know, moment of, you know, quasi infamy in front of the House on american Activities Committee, he, you know, boarded a plane or a boat or however he got there, you know, almost like the next day. And in Zurich and, you know, was in Zurich for quite a bit of time before he went, you know, to Berlin to form the Berliner Ensemble. So, you know, he for for Brecht, the kind of the incubator of his plays during the war, because he didn't have any place else where he could, you know, he wrote in German. He had a few places, you know, kind of translated or wrote in, in English in the United States, but he never really kind of found a foothold. Here, uh, you know, in, in the US during exile. Um, and yeah, you know, I don't think that uh, Hirschfeld and Brecht had a great relationship. Hirschfeld also didn't really love um, the work of Tennessee Williams or Arthur Miller, but he, you know, he recognized the importance of these writers, right? And that's also a really interesting thing about him is that he didn't let his kind of personal feelings about these things get in the way of his like ability to recognize that like artistically they were, you know, kind of important and, uh, and would have impact. But the other answer to your, question, Stuart, is that like there are stories of, you know, the sort of the war ends. And I think Hirschfeld says this in one of his speeches, you know, we all hoped that when the war ended, you know, sort of attics would open up up and drawers would open and there would be like plays that people had been writing in Germany and you know they would just sort of emerge and there would be this new like literature that we could all rely on. And he was like, that's not the case. Like there was nothing there. And so, you know, there are stories of the actors at the at the Schauspielhaus in Zurich staying up until midnight retyping scripts so so that they can mail them in care packages along with like cigarettes and chocolate and props and costumes back to their colleagues in germany so that they can rebuild the theater so that like that that it's like the incubator is direct right like you can you know it's not just sort of a vague oh he had this influence it's like he literally you know they literally typed the scripts and sent them back to germany and austria so it's a very direct line and you know, uh, you know, they were they, uh, part of the influences. These are the things that he decided to have translated, right? Or, you know, these were the authors that he chose to, you know, from the German speaking world that he chose to feature on the um, Zurich stage. So, you know, the, uh, I mean, there are a lot of people who are left out. Um, and, you know, one of the things I talk about in the article I wrote is that, you know, we, I, I don't want to fault Hirschfeld, but there are almost no women <laughs> on these lists. There are no people of color. <laughs> it's really very white and male. And that's our canon. That's our 20th century canon. Can you talk a little bit about what that kind of, what his taste shaped, like how those plays, a sense of how that maybe shaped post-war German consciousness a little bit more? Is there that, you mentioned that kind of liberal multiplicity of viewpoints. What else would you sort of- Yeah, point? and it's also, I mean, he, he a lot of these plays are very modernist. He's, he, had a, he had a very modernist taste. So he was very interested in experimental form, which is, um, something that you see a lot in the post-war German theater, plays that are formally very, you know, not, you know, not necessarily sort of like a, a you know, kind of your, your, your traditional narrative that sort of goes, you know, um, you know, kind of linearly from, you know, like a, a moment of conflict through higher conflict to resolution, but rather is maybe a dream play form or, you know, poetic or like one of the plays that he really loved was, um, you know, the the Satin Shoes by Pla Paul Claudel. And that's like a 12 hour play that, you know, kind of like moves from one you know place to another and one time to another and has like these like, you know, flights of fancy and like things that are almost unstageable. So he was very attracted to plays that really broke open, you know, formally what the theater was thought to be able to do. Um, and I think you see that influence very much in Western German theater, you know, sort of in the post-war period where there's a lot of really interesting kind of formal experimentation that you're not seeing necessarily in the United States to the same extent. His taste in American plays was very much of, um, or the, I, I don't know if it was taste in American plays, the kinds of plays that he translated from the U.S., um, like, you know, Williams and Miller, you know, were, were plays that kind of, uh, 
that dug into what he considered to be sort of unpleasant truths. Um, so often like, you know, revealing the underbelly of society in ways that, you know, kind of uh, people might have found distasteful, but he was like, you know, but th these are things that must be you know, investigated. So we can't shy away from that kind of thing. So there's, there's uh, yeah, the, I think there's a, it's eclectic, um, but I would say that, you know, the, some of the things that you see in the programming is stuff that we would find very difficult to stage even today. One thing that struck me was the story of Our Town, which is probably one of the most produced American plays of the 20th century that was written while Thornton Wilder was in Zurich. Um, and we could tell a bit of the story of that play because when I think about sort of classic experimentalism <laughs> like in American theater, there's, there's something about that play and there's something about the way it approaches the sort of the small town American life. But maybe you could tell a bit of the story of that play because I, I, I don't, you as an expert would tell me what, what it feels like that seems almost typical of what you're talking about. Yeah, so um, the, you know, it was one of, actually Our Town was one of the first plays that, uh, and the, our sister's director's name was Velterlin, Oscar Velterlin. It was one of the first plays he directed at the Schauspiel Haus. Um, and, you know, it was a play that, uh, so Wilder had a relationship with Zurich. Uh, I think he was friends with Thomas Mann. And it's, and he was also friends with Hirschfeld. Um, and, uh, you know, and the two of them may have even learned to know each other, become acquainted through Thomas Mann. But the play was, you know, it was relatively well received by the Zurich audience. Um, and, you know, but even more, it had the effect of like stimulating a lot of conversation. They would have these post show conversations. And for our town's conversation, they, you know, had to, um, you know, find a new room to house all the people who wanted to talk about the play. So like they actually like, you know, had an overflow crowd for the for the conversation. Um, but, you know, uh, another way in which that play had some influence, interestingly, is that um, according to Wilder's biographer, um, that uh, he made arrange Wilder made arrangements to give his Swiss our town royalties to an Austrian German exile fund after um, the Nazis invaded Poland in 1939. So Wilder understood that like he could sort of help in some small way with, uh, you know, the, you know, to, to help uh, people who had been impacted by the war through using his, you know, kind of our town royalties. But, um, uh, you know, the play was uh, a play that, you know, I think resonated really, really well with Swiss audiences. The play of Wilder's that was really influential was um, The Skin of Our Teeth which had like a bigger kind of reception in post-war Germany than it had anywhere else in the world. Um, West Germans love this play. Um, and I think that that's due to the fact that it really does have a kind of sober looking back at sort of the effects of war and the effects like the, you know, the sort of terrible things that human beings do to each other. And it's very, you know, it kind of starts in the ice age and ends after a terrible world war. And it sort of, you know, places this very ordinary family in the midst of like these catastrophic circumstances. And I think that that just really resonated with what had happened in West Germany um, in a, you know, sort of post-war kind of mindset. And if you were to, um, Bernie, I mean, for you, as um you know something connected with you like very strongly about sort of everything we're talking about sort of the multiplicity of viewpoints the kind of liberalism you know, what given what once wendy did a research and what you learned what surprised you about what she learned about your uncle um or what sort of prompted you to learn to think differently about his legacy well i, I don't want to get too fancy but his career to me was a terra inc but there's a terror, in kind of unrecognizable terror. So I said territory. So everything I everything I know, I learned from Wendy. She has, she's the expert. And she's done a fantastic job of documenting and putting out the story. I you know, I, I, Stuart, I was an engineer, mm -hmm. <laughs> but at a university and actually acted actually I acted in the theater. My 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 high point was. We had a group called Mustard and Cheese in Lehigh, and they did um, Murder in the Cathedral. Mm -hmm. And the, the university had a wonderful Episcopal church. And the big scene was we staggered in drunk and killed <laughs> killed uh, Thomas of Beckett, and then just sat there and enjoyed the pleasure of it all. So that, <laughs> that's really, that was my high, the high point of my theater career. Mm -hmm. But I guess maybe sort of given your own personal history, and I've, you know, I've read some of the stuff in the archives where uh, Kurt was writing to your family in Buffalo and was yeah. talking during the war. And 
um, you know, sort of what that kind of like seeing that powerful influence that Wendy's talking about that, that he had on uh, German intellectual life after the war, um, as well as the incredible uh, work that he was able to save so many people, so many artists, so much thought. Yeah. Well, I've really, I've learned this now in, in, the, in the last 10, 15, 20 years. I don't know. I've, Stuart, you know me. I'm a pragmatist. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm obviously interested in the intellectual side. I'm interested in the political side. But it's, you know, it's, it's, I just take it all in. Uh, but we, Can I you know, we, that, Stuart? Go ahead. Yeah, please. Yeah. I think what's remarkable about this story is that, so you asked me earlier about sort of what does a dramaturg do? Yeah. And most of what a dramaturg does is invisible. It's, you know, it's kind of intellectual and sort of consulting and side work that can be very influential on a production of a play, but is like nowhere documented or really, it's often documented by the dramaturg, but it's not really seen on stage in a way that like a person can point to it and say like, you know, this is, this is the dramaturgy of the play. It's mm -hmm. about, you know, kind of thinking about about the bigger issues, it's kind of the person who's looking at the forest while every, you know, the, the forest while everyone else is like buried in the trees. And so, you know, it's a kind of behind the scenes role and it's often unrecognized or under recognized. And what's remarkable to me about Hirschfeld's story is that he is a quintessential dramaturg, that like everything he did in his life kind of was in just a kind of quiet heroism and a kind of under recognized influence. And he was very comfortable in that role, apparently. I mean, he doesn't seem to have sort of wanted the limelight. He had opportunities to become, you know, a much more well-known director, even an artistic director in Germany. He could have raised his profile. He could have, you know, left the provinces of Switzerland and been working in Berlin. But he, you know, he chose to stay in Zurich. He did eventually become the artistic director of the Playhouse. But, you know, it's, uh, but I don't think that that was really, a, you know, the kind of high profile thing that being in Berlin would have been. But that, you know, all of the influence that he had was very much behind the scenes, a kind of, you know, like, you know, and, and yet he had this enormous impact. I think, you know, and I, I think you could even say like his impact went beyond sort of the German speaking world because many of these plays that he lifted up continue to be part of the canon all around the world, right? They, they get taught in, you know, your sort of standard theater history courses, you know, as the kind of like, touch points of European 20th century, you know, kind of modern theater. And it's hard to say whether or not those plays would have had that kind of status if he hadn't preserved them at the Schauspiel House. Because you have to remember, almost all of Europe was under Nazi control during the war. So there's just a, you know, there's a theater in Sweden and there's, you know, the Schauspiel House. And then there are theaters in England, but they are not even like touching most of the international repertory. They're just doing British plays. So his influence is really goes way beyond the German speaking world. It might even be the thing that kind of forms the canon. And yet, you know, first of all, we can't know that for, for sure. I mean, I'm just kind of mooting it as a, like a chicken and egg thing, but also he's, uh, you know, like it's, it's like, he's just done it so, so behind the scenes that it's kind of like this quintessential dramaturgy where it's like, yes, I did that. And, you know, I can't really put my name on it, but that's okay. So it's, it's kind of lovely that his, he's got such a consistency of sort of who he was as a person and the kind of influence that he had on the world, um, you know, not just through the theater, but also on people's lives. Uh, the, the heroism that he demonstrates in making sure that people are rescued from Germany is just so remarkable. Yeah, and I think we haven't delved into that much on this conversation, but I encourage you to listen to the podcast because we go into some of the details of that. It's an extraordinary, a great personal risk to himself. Um, and I think it's also, we probably shouldn't underplay how performing of these plays in the thirties and in, during the war was a great danger to everyone involved. They could have lost their paperwork and been kicked out by the Swiss at any moment. And uh, the, the artistic and physical courage it took to put on some of these plays uh, was really quite extraordinary during that period, which I think speaks to, you know, the sort of um, some what you're speaking about that kind of esprit de corps of a theater group and the that what animates it from the, the position of someone like that who's like like Kurt who is a leader in that in the, speaks heavily to that. I, I'm curious if you could talk a, a little bit just from for both of you. I mean, this is 
all histories are kind of remembering and re-remembering. And like we've just talked about Kurt, how he sort of set the canon. This, this process in a very small way of picking these stories from the archives is a little bit about saying, here are some stories that should be remembered, that maybe wouldn't be remembered or should be remembered in this particular way, because you know, generations change, what's important changes. And I, I wonder maybe from a kind of a, a philosophical perspective, Bernie, you know, you've been driven, you know, you're a pragmatist, but you're driven by a strong kind of builder's impulse in the world of narrative and the world of memory. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about sort of what, a little bit about some of your, your larger spiritual goals with this work and sort of with this story in particular of your uncle, what you're hoping people will draw from. Oh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> Uh, no, no, it's, it's, um, I think it's, especially with this group, it's, it's, it's pushing the narrative that we all need to push that, you know, here we are, there is a liberal world and it, human rights and fighting tyranny and fighting autocracy and, uh, those sort of things. And that, that's the message that, um, that it's being delivered and uh telling that particular story i think helps but i don't know story you're you're a far better judge of <laughs> no all i'm doing is giving word i think to the spirit which you animated this whole project which maybe is maybe a little bit of a genetic thing with your uncle you know um behind the scenes making things happen um no it, it's you know let's say uh well it was, it was a wonderful story i don't think it was it, certainly and wendy you can comment on this i don't think you, prior to the time that we including you wendy very much until we pushed this story out put it out there people just weren't aware of the important role you know it was just it was just some you know well they had a theater and they had good plays and i don't know that's wendy what do you think yeah, I and mean, I think the I think you actually gave me the phrase that, you know, uh, best sums it up, which is, you know, what is it? His impact so far outweighs his legacy. And I, th I remember you saying that and I was like, yeah, that's it. Exactly. OK, nice. Well, nicely said. I, I don't remember saying it, but I'll take <laughs> your word for it. Hey, Wendy, for, I mean, for you as an academic, um, and this is a we're, this is engaging in kind of communal and popular history. You've done the academic work. I'm just curious as to what your reflections are from that perspective about the story and about this process, ongoing one at the Leo Beck Institute. Say that, I'm sorry, say that again. Just sort of a, 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 talking about this, both the story, what you sort of learned about that kind of popularized, that communal storytelling for a popular audience and what that process of, for you about revisiting these stories and telling them for an audience what, what what that means to you in general both in terms of this particular story and where it's what this whole process means in more in, in a more general way yeah i mean i guess i mean one of the things i would say is that like at each time it goes through a different iteration i learn something so like i learned something from the way you told the story in the podcast and I learned something from when we went to Switzerland and I heard other people sort of be telling it. So it always feels like they're like extra, extra pieces that are kind of coming into view each time mm -hmm. I find myself in a, in a situation where I'm asked a question and I think, oh, I hadn't thought about that, you know? And so then I like get curious again and I start looking for new things. Um, but I also just like kind of want to underline what Bernie said a second ago, which is that to me, this, the story of Kurt Hirschfeld is a story about the choices that people make. Like he made really heroic choices, but he also made principled choices and he made a choice, yeah. you know, and he was, he, he had a philosophy of life that was very, cons that he applied consistently throughout his career and throughout his life. And it had to do with sort of understanding that like to, to be a human being is to be somebody, is to be complicated and is to be open to new ideas and is to be interested in a multiplicity of ideas. And, and that was the bedrock of everything that he did. And, we should all be that way. Like we should all kind of continue in that vein. That's so beautifully said, Wendy. I don't know. Um, I'm getting the signal from Sophie that we're almost done. But Bernie, last word and first word to you. Um, you guys are great. It's been a wonderful experience. And uh, um, 
couldn't have picked better people to work with. I mean, it's, 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 I'm extremely grateful. Well, I have to say, I'm grateful to you, Bernie. Thank you for, thank you for the cold call. <laughs> this has been a great journey. <laughs> I do, <laughs> I've, 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 this, I've, I've done before. a lot of that kind of thing. You're not the only one. But I'm sure I'm not. <laughs> let's say it in that, internationally with all kinds of people in all kinds of professions all right but in most cases and pretty much all cases a long strong continuing well Stuart, you're another example i mean i said Stuart, let's do a fundraising video you said no i said okay let's do it. a few years later let's do a promotional video and you said no we're going to do a podcast and well, you convinced me and obviously it was the right answer okay well i will say this the nice thing about the medium has developed with podcasts. We have 30 seconds, I will say, is that it allows for complexity and length, which yeah. video is so expensive. And it's just, it almost was waiting. The medium was waiting to evolve to like, to tell your story here and this, the, all these wonderful stories from the archives, but because yeah. it takes, it's, it's hard. It's hard to tell these stories any other way, really. And it's great. This great popular audio medium has emerged just at this time. Please like this video and subscribe for more content from the Leo Beck Institute.